Okay, so today we'll be talking about uh, chapter 13 of the book, which is uh, the last and final chapter, which is on uh, multiple testing. So, which is a multiple testing. So, uh, basically, what I learned about how the book is about uh, is, is not something uh, that is very new. So, it's about a uh, hypothesis testing, which is very applicable uh, in applied research. What we are what is going on today in applied research. So, uh, because basically he said that in every experiment, uh, we must learn how to what every experiment we are conducting, you know, we are going to have a series of research questions. So it's just kind of giving out like a basis of a guiding principles that we are going to apply in our research. So uh, is basically about uh, what I learned is about uh, hypothesis uh, testing, which is very useful uh, in research. It's very useful in research. And um, um, basically what uh, uh, in hypothesis testing, uh, what I learned, what I was able to pick uh, from the chapter is that there are four basic principles uh, in which we, are, we have to apply in order to test uh, uh, in order to conduct an hypothesis test. First of all, we need to we need to define uh, we need to define our hypothesis where we set the null and against uh, the alternative hypothesis. The null which simply means uh, the default uh, state of, of belief about uh, about the world. Maybe we can say maybe let's take for an instance. Uh, uh, we can say that maybe it's, it's good. The, uh, uh, let's take for an instance, since I am into uh, agricultural research, maybe we are testing different rates of fertilizer on, on different variety of corn, where we can have the null hypothesis being that if the different rates of fertilizer, the end fertilizer we are applying does not have uh, 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 will give us, uh, we are going to have uh, the same response from the corn. So, okay, we are gonna get the same response from the test crop. So that is the default state of the world. We are seeing no effect that this, we apply this, we apply this, we are expected to see that there is no difference. But while looking at the other extreme, the alternative hypothesis, we say at least among those different rates of end fertilizer, one will, give us a very higher yield. So, which is uh, basically one approach. We talk about hypothesis testing. So after setting this hypothesis, we have defined the hypothesis in which we want to use for our experiments. Uh, the next thing in which they talk about is for us to carry out the test, uh, construct the test statistics. And within the test statistics, uh, they come forward with this, uh, the, the question, so where they have, the, they, come, they come forward uh, with the equation 13.1 and 13.2. Uh, so once we have this uh, in place, once we have this in place, we are going to, gen to generate uh, the test statistics. So the next thing we need to look at is that how do we, how do we derive inference? How do we derive inference from the hypothesis in which we have been able to set forward. So in order for us to do that, we need to, uh, we need to derive uh, the p-value from this test statistics because it will come out with a p-value and this p-value, we are going to set a threshold of either accepting or rejecting uh, the given uh, hypo null hypothesis in which we have defined earlier on which states that this fertilizer has uh, it has no effect on the response. The, the different varieties of uh, we are testing, the fertilizer will have no uh, no effect. So we we need to define the threshold. So I think they said the notion of p value provides with a way to formalize as answer this question. The p values define the probability of a test equal to more of extreme observed and. What I also learned in the chapter is that they said the, the notion of the p-value is the is still under a rapid debate in the applied science because of the abuse 
uh, of the p value because in so many cases they do talk about instances of people not actually using uh, the p value in the in the way in which it's supposed uh, to be used they, they talk about that is the most abused uh, term when it comes uh, to applied research which we face because if some people they might uh, they are not using it in the right way how it's supposed to be interpreted because in every p value we can we can draw a threshold is are we making our decision at the five percent confidence is it at uh one percent or is it at 99.9 nine percent uh confidence interval but high that is in the area of agricultural research majority of the work uh we do we normally draw our threshold uh, at the five percent uh, confidence interval, but I do know that people that are in area of uh, biological research in area of medicine they normally draw uh, their threshold at ninety nine point nine nine percent accurate. So they also look at uh, the value of the test statistics uh, using uh, this uh, or probability density uh, functions, okay? Where, where they say that they have a t test t value to be equals to 2.33. So, but from this threshold down to the, my fire rights, uh, they do discover that the values that fall from the threshold to my fire rights, they are, they are approximately uh, 1%. Why? why the, the remaining data points so fall within within two two percent fall within two percent uh within two percent and which they went further to say that that means we see that the vast majority which is 98 percent of the data that is within zero and one distribution falls between negative 2.33 and positive uh, 2.33. Uh, so once uh, they talk about, once we have decided on, on the test statistics, we have drawn, the, we have gotten the p-value which we are going to be using uh, to base our inference because our inference uh, is going to be based on the p-value. The next step in which they discuss in the book is reach. The, our criteria to decide whether to reject the null hypothesis for the alternative hypothesis. And this one is going to be based on our, our confidence level in which we must have defined for before performing the test statistics because we might have fixed that our confidence intervals in which we are going to use to derive inference is going to be maybe at 5%, is it at 1%, is it at 99.99%. So this one is a basis in which we have already defined before setting our hypothesis. Remember, we start from the hypothesis, we perform the test statistics, we, we, we look at the p-value, we derive the p-value, which we'll be using to make our inference. Then we now decide whether to reject the null hypothesis so this will be based on our level of significance in which we have defined. Is it at 5%? So if it is at 5%, we know that if the p-value uh, if the p-value falls below five, less than 5%, we know that there is, uh, there is a difference between uh, the, the treatments in which we are seeing. So in that case, uh, we fail to reject uh, the null line. Uh, in that case, we reject uh, we we reject the null hypothesis and um, uh, we accept the alternative uh, hypothesis. So, but if in this case the p value the p value is greater than uh, zero point uh, zero five, in that case, what happened? We fail to reject uh, the null hypothesis. Okay, so we have to retain uh, the null hypothesis. So, I think they also. Uh, they also gave us a decision rule. So in in the in and in this decision rule, they said if we reject uh, the null hypothesis, if we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true, 
But in that case, we have committed what we call a type one error, which is what I discovered. So they also say that if we reject uh, the uh, null hypothesis when, uh, if, if we do not reject uh, the null hypothesis, okay? If we do not reject the null hypothesis when, when, when the null hypothesis is actually uh, false, then in that case, we know that we have committed a type two error. So, and they, they said the, the type one error is what we, when we are having a false positive uh, result, I think I'm right, then the, the type two error is when we are having the false or always occur when we are having the false uh, false uh, negative, when we are having the false negative. I don't know, can you hear me? Okay, I was thinking. Yep. Okay. Okay, so I think they talk about type one and type two error, we shall look at that. So yeah, they were talking, this other chapter, they were talking about a bit of challenges uh, they do face with uh, multiple testing. So yeah, they were looking at a brief of history where the first one, they look at the family-wise error rates, the family-wise error rates. So which they still make use of the same chart in which we have seen above there, where we, where we have the null hypothesis, uh, we are rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. So they gave a value of B, you know, where they did not reject the null hypothesis when it is actually uh, uh, when it is actually false. So they have they also give the value of U. So they did the same thing. Yeah, they are having the value of S and also the value of uh, W. So in this case, they are having a total value. Here yeah, we are having R. Here yeah, we are having M minus R. We are we are null hypothesis is true, we are having a value of MO where the null hypothesis is actually false. We are having the value of M minus MO. So here we are having R and M minus R where we have M. So, so a couple of these, they say, what is the family-wise error? So they say that the family-wise error, they study or reject, they, they recall that type one error rate is probably is a probability of, of rejecting the null if the null is true. So if we are rejecting the null hypothesis, if the null hypothesis is actually true, uh, in that case, we have committed a type one error. So the family-wise error rates, okay, from what they gave us is a probability of V where V is greater than or equals to one. Probability of having V where the value is greater than or equals to is greater than or equals to one. And here they say that the strategy, a strategy of rejecting any null hypothesis for which the p-value is below alpha, that is controlling the type one error for each null hypothesis at level of alpha leads to a family-wise error rate of this, where the family-wide error rate is one minus probability of v equals to zero. So the, so we also have one minus probability of do not falsely reject uh, the null hypothesis, which is what the, the formula-wise error rate stand for. Uh, and it's also giving us one minus probability of do not falsely uh, reject uh, the, null, the null hypothesis. So, so, and we also recall from the basic probability that if two events, A and B are independent, then probability of A intersection B is equals to probability of A times the probability of B. And, and the family-wise error rates, uh, it was also from equation 13.4, they were also able to derive equation 13.5. We are, which is giving us one minus alpha, which is equals to one minus one into alpha minus alpha raised to the power of what? 
M. Okay, so here, for the number of, here we have the number of hypotheses being tested. So we have 500, uh, we have 500 uh, different hypotheses that they, they tested here. Okay, they have a threshold. They also have the family-wise error rates. So we have uh, family-wise error rates sets alpha set as 0 0.05, because in every hypothesis, we need to set a threshold for where we are going to base our decision. So this, they are setting the threshold at 5%, these at 1%, at, uh, at these at 99.99%, uh, uh, which is this. So we can see that a majority of the decision, uh, uh, we are going to, we can see that majority, majority falls within uh, the, uh, the 0 0.05 and 0 0.01. It's just few uh, that fall under the 99.99%. Uh, so, so, which shows that we have a very small, we will have a very small uh, family-wise error rate at the 99.99% because it's about less than 0.4. But when we are going to the 0 0.05 and 0 0.01, when we are going to the 0 0.05 and 0 0.01, it's huge. The numbers is more, but when we are in the 99.99%, we have a smaller number of family-wise error rates. So this is a table. I think we have talked about the multiple testing, the p-value. These are just the p-value for one. We have 0 0.06. So for this, we have 0 point, this 0 0.012. So for three, so these are not significant. This is not significant. This is not significant. Yeah, they talk about uh, the various approach in which we can use to control for the family-wise error rates. So they talk about the Benforoni method. They talk about the Benforoni method, and they also talk about they talk about the Benforoni method to control for the family-wise uh, error rates. And they also look at the Tukey's uh, method to control for the family-wise error rates. But when they look at, they compared the Ben Foroni approach to the Tukey approach, uh, what they discover in the book, because they compared both the Ben Foroni, uh, the Tukey's, and the Benjamin, Benjamin Hodgeberg uh, procedure, but they discovered that the Tukey's approach was more, was more robust. It, it performed better than the other approach when as they discuss in the book, they discover that the Tukey's approach uh, it outperformed uh, the other approach. So, so here yeah, this was an example of what they did. Here yeah, they have how many? They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they have seven that fall below this threshold, and we have three that falls above this threshold. So here yeah, the same trend. So when they did all the comparison of ordering of p-values and they, they place it on the log scale and using different uh, approach, using different uh, procedure, uh, what they discover is that they discover that uh, using Tukey's Tukey's method uh, was more perform uh, performed every other approach. Yeah, because they, they recommended that uh, Tukey's outperform every other, it outperform both the Benjamin uh, Oshberg approach. So here they have an example here where they say each panel displays for a separate simulation, the sorted p-value for test of n is equals to 15 hypotheses. 
So they were looking at 15 different hypotheses corresponding to pairwise tests for the equality of Gs equals to six mean. So now they have the, the, the MO is equals to 10. Okay, we have a 10, MO is 10. So the true null hypotheses are displayed in black. Okay, so the true nulls hypothesis, they, display, they were displayed in black and the rest are in red. When controlling for the family-wise error rate at level 0.05, Ben Foran rejects all null hypotheses. You can see uh, Ben Foran rejected all the null hypotheses that fall below the black line. So all the null, all the values that fall below this black line. Ben Fonale rejected all the null hypotheses. Whereas Tokis reject all those that falls below the blue line. Thus, Tokis methods are slightly higher power than the Ben Fonale methods. So we can see that the Tokis method, it has a slightly higher power than the other two approach from what uh, uh, the talk about in the book. So this is just a plot uh, showing the family-wise error rates in the x-axis and also the power in the y-axis. Here we are having the number of uh, the number of samples. Here we are having 10, here we are having 100, and here we are having 500. So we are having 500. So we can see that where we can see that the number as a number as a number as a numbers uh, as a number goes up, we can see that the power drops a bit. The power drops. So as a number, as with the smaller the number we are having, we are having the higher highest power. Because when we're having n is equals to 10, we can see that we're having the highest power. So, but once, as we keep on increasing the value, the power keep on dropping. The power keep on dropping. So that means uh, the family-wise error rates was, the family-wise error rates was high when we have The highest power was obtained here at when we have close, which is close to 1.0 for m is equals to 10. But when we are having m, when we are having m is equals to 500, I think uh, the power, it dropped a bit. Then to a certain point, it begins to go up. Why this one, the power started from a bit higher at the higher side before it begins to stabilize, before it begins to stabilize. So here they say that in simulating setting in which 90% of the, of the M null hypothesis are true, we display the power, a function of false null hypothesis that we successfully reject as a function of the family-wise error rate. The pops correspond to the M is equal to 10 blue, as the value of the M increases, that is as M increases, the power decreases just as I said, then the vertical dash line indicates a family-wise error rates of zero points, uh, of 0 0.05, okay? Which is what uh, the line is showing. So they were looking at the trade-off between the family wise error rates and the power. So there's, uh, here we can see that in figure 13.5, which indicates that it, it is reasonable to control the family wide error rate when M takes on a small value. So that as M takes on a small value, just as, as we hear, are here, it is very, easy to control uh, the power, but as the value of M keep on increases, so we know that it's very difficult for us to control uh, the power 
uh, it's very difficult for us to control uh, the power. It's unlikely that we are going to be able to control uh, the power in that experiment because we can see that as the value of M increases, the, uh, that is how we see that the power keep on uh, the power keep on going off. So now they now say that uh, the last they talk about uh, also talk about the false discovery rate, which is false positive. The false discovery rate maybe in a situation whereby we have set up our hypothesis, uh, we are we are accepting our uh, given hypothesis when the actually that is not true when it is actually false. So. So yeah, we are having, as just discussed, when M is large, okay, then trying to prevent any false positive for the family-wise error rate control is simply too stringent. So how do we control for the false uh, discovery rate? There we have false discovery rate, which is defined as this, where we have V all over R, okay? When we control the first default, we say Q is equals to what? 20%. We are rejecting many null hypotheses as possible while guaranteeing that no more than 20% of those rejected null hypotheses are false positive uh, on average. What? So we also uh, they also talk about another procedure is to use uh, the Benjamin Hushbeck uh, procedure, and in this procedure, uh, it has a question, it has a series of steps in which it specifies that we can use to control the false discovery rate. First of all, we specify Q, which is the level at which to control uh, the false discovery rates. Then two. We compute the p values, which is from p1 to what pm for the m null hypothesis, where we have h01 to h0m. Then we, we now order the m, which is p value, so that p1 is less, is less than or equals to p2, less than or equals to a certain value, also less than or equals to probability of M. So then we define L, which is the maximum value of P of J into P of J less than, which is less than P of J over M. Then we reject the null hypothesis if HO of J for which P of J is less than or equals to uh, P of L. So here we can say that uh, the false discovery rate for Benjamin Osberg is when is when FDR is less than or equals to Q. So here they were just showing multiple testing where we have the alpha put at different uh, threshold at 0.05. At 0 0.1, at 0 0.03, we have in all the p-values. We also have the index. Here we have in how many hypotheses we were testing, 500 different uh, different uh, hypotheses that were tested. Then these were the p-values. So I think they had the values. Okay, so they say the green line is for the false family-wide error rate for the control threshold corresponding to the, okay? Green lines indicate the p-values for the threshold corresponding to the false family-wide error rate for the control. Here the ben, ben, ben for any procedure at level of 0 0.05 left, level of 0 0.1, which is seen in the center and right 0 0.3, 
Then the orange line indicate p value for the threshold corresponding for the false discovery rates. So this is a false discovery rate. Okay. So yeah, we can see when the false discovery rate is controlled at 0 0.1, 146 null hypothesis we have rejected, which is at the center. Here we have 146 null that was rejected. The corresponding p-value are shown in blue. When the false discovery rate is controlled at Q, 0 0.3, we have 279 null hypothesis are rejected, which is a far right. is the far right, we have 279. No hypothesis were all rejected. So this approach where they were simply talking about a resampling approach uh, to p-values and false uh, discovery and false discovery rates. I think this, I think I stopped in the first part. I did not have much time to look at, uh, to really look at this, but I think we can still discuss about it. I don't know if you will have time to look at this, the resampling approach. I can speak in if you want. I, I, I skimmed it, um, but I didn't go too in depth. Okay. You said? I yes, said, I, was... I, I, I skimmed that section, but I didn't, I didn't go too in depth. Okay, um, okay. okay. Let's look, let me just come through. I think here they were talking about we can compute the defined, in, compute C defined in 13.1 which is in the initial equation on to the original data. And then for B is one and B, where B is large. Then we now compute the, the B values. So I think this is just similar to the threshold in which we saw in the beginning with this way, the distribution. For now, our T statistics is now towards uh, the left. Now is now reading as 2.09365. So how many percent of the data have set fall in this group? The p-value is 0 0.04. The sampling p-value was 0.04. So the theoretical p-value was this. So the resampling p-value is now 0 0.042. So it's somewhat identical to the actual because the 11 gene in the CAM data set has a test statistics of this, okay? It's theoretical and resampling null distribution are almost identical. So it's almost, reason resampling, we almost get almost identical, we almost get identical shape of the raw data set in which uh, we use. So we can see that resampling was doing quite a very good job. In this case, we can say, which is the same thing here, they still comment here that the theoretical p-value equals zero point and is, the resampling p-value is also, so it's still close, it's still close. Okay. Is this still result from the resampling part? Is still the resampling? Then this is just like the lab review of the hypothesis test. So here they are just using the base R approach where we have R norm 10 by 10. Here they are performing the T test, okay? The T test, which we are going to get like the T statistics, okay? Then we are going to derive the P values, which we are going to use as a basis for either accepting or, or, or for either rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. So we have a table of to make a decision 
repeat HO false 50 times, repeat HO true 50 times. So we are going to have this. So, so we look at the family-wise error rate. So this was for the family-wise error rate. Then they are setting par because they want to create one column, column one, row one. So they were here, yeah, they were using uh, ISLR2. They're using the font data sets. They can put the fit P value, P adjusted and P minimum. Then they apply the function. So where they have arrived at the multiple testing to get this, look at the false discovery. I think uh, okay, so I think that is just all, but I pray I will have more time to dip into uh, the exercise ahead of next week. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a dense chapter, I think, but yes, but, but it's you know it's it's like doing doing inference at scale with, with multiple hypotheses. Like, what's the yes yes probability yes. that 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 you make a mistake like that? You know. Yes, I think I learned what I, I learned because this is also. The, is applicable in res our applied research because you know in applied research today we have a series of research questions we need to set up hypotheses we set up the experiment we need to collect data and we need to analyze the data in order to uh, derive conclusion from the data so I think this is very it's a very useful chapter and they kept it to the last part of the book. So I, I pray I will have time to look at the labs, look at what they are saying in the labs so that we can really discuss uh, next uh, next week, uh, Tuesday. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you very much.